Hi, Leah from my sewing room. Um, today I'm going to be showing you guys some follow up to a project I started uh, about a month ago, uh, which is uh, doing an OSD tiling scene. And some of you who tuned, tuned into that incredibly long video watched me make ev almost every possible embroidery mistake. Um, it was it was really quite an epic adventure on Facebook. The YouTube uh, version that we've cut down um, doesn't have as much excitement and as much of it has all the issues still there. Um, but there's a lot of fast forwarding through all the all the sewing, so you don't have to watch the embroidery happen when it's happening smoothly. Um, but you do get to watch me uh, rescue all sorts of ridiculousness in the embroidery. Um, had no tension on my thread. I actually had to cut my hoop, cut my embroidery off my needle plate. <laughs> so really good education. Um, really, really not my cleanest education from a, it went perfectly standpoint. So um, even, even with lots of experience doing embroidery, uh, we all have those days where things don't go quite right. Um, but I finished uh, making my tiling scene. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk you through kind of the beginning, the middle and the end of what uh, this looks like. And I had so much fun doing it that I've actually made two. <laughs> I got going and then partway through my kids were like, oh, I like that. And it was gonna be a gift for my father-in-law, but they, but my kids were in. So I'm like, mm, I have enough fabric. I have enough thread, let's keep going. And so I've actually made two entire white buck tiling scenes. The white buck tiling scene is the one I was working on. That is. That is what we were doing. So the day we did this, we actually stitched it on two different machines. Um, the pattern itself came in two sizes. Um, so this one fit in the five by seven hoop. And then the one I did uh, fit in an eight by eight hoop. So same, same great design, two different sizes, depending on what you were after and what kind of size machine you have but they were both great. And my whole plan was that I could stitch the bigger one on the 10 needle way faster because I didn't have to do color changes and then everything went wrong. <laughs> so anyway, here we are, mine are done. I'm gonna walk you guys through the next couple steps beyond actually doing the embroidery. So I'm gonna set this one aside. So a couple different stabilizers used. And uh, the first one is fusible woven. So fusible woven is going to go on the back of your quilting cotton, if that's the fabric that you've chosen to use for the back of your design. So fusible woven on the back, it'll give the quilting cotton a little more structure and it's less likely to pucker as it sews. Uh, some of these tiling seams are very, very dense stitching. So this will keep things nice and solid for you. Um, so that's step one is fusible woven. Fusible woven comes in white or black. And I've actually used white and black because I had like cream blocks for my deer and then my border blocks were black. And I was running out of white fusible woven at home. So black fusible woven on there, and white fusible woven on the other. And it just adds a little bit of structure. Um, and then a heavyweight tearaway uh, stabilizer is the other one that I've used in here. Um, it's, it's, it's crunchy. It's, it's stiff, but it's soft enough to be hoopable easily, if that makes sense. So heavyweight tearaway, or did I use heavyweight cutaway? What's my roll at home? Oh no, this is the bad one. That's the one that didn't work. That's not the stabilizer I used at home. This is the heavyweight tearaway, tearaway. <laughs> but like I said, heavyweight. So those are the things you need. Um, it would also be a good idea to start your fabric before you get started and before you even put that fusible woven on it. So I just used Mary Ellen's Best Press. And gave it a generous starching, let it dry overnight, ironed it flat, and then added the fusible woven. So those are the things I needed to start the embroidery. And then really it's just fabric and thread at this point and a lot of color changes. So um, a central deer block, the face, I believe it had about 15 color changes in it. And some of them are the same color repeated a couple different places in the design. Um, and a couple of them are just placement and uh, lines for your seam lines at the end. So you just get to hang out and change threads. Um, if, you, if you happen 
to have a multi-needle embroidery machine at home, which I do, um, I'm able to set up 10 threads at once on my machine. And then I'll be honest, I walk away <laughs> and let it stitch until it runs out of bobbin thread or it needs me to switch to color 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So um, over the course of the weekend, I was able to just come up to my machine about every 20, 20 to 25 minutes, change the bobbin. And every two or three hours when I was stitching my border blocks for this, I was able to come and switch out my fabric and put a new piece in to make more border blocks. So that's kind of how you get this far. So once you have all these blocks made, you need to do something with them because it's all well and good to have a giant stack of blocks like this, but um, it's not a quilt yet or a wall hanging. So that's the part we're going to do today is how to get from blocks to your wall hanging. So first things first is you'll need to trim your blocks. And OASD is really smart. They gave you trimming lines. So in the Thailand seam block, the final stitching line that is stitched is done in black on this, on this particular block. And it is where the finished line of this block will be. So we need to add a seam allowance so that we can um, sew it together to the next piece. So OSD's instructions are a quarter inch, uh, trim out quarter inch outside that line. And on some of these blocks, it's really easy to see where that line lands. And other ones, it's a little trickier. So you can also flip it over and cut it from the back. You'll just want to be consistent if you're just inside the line or just outside the line or right on the line on your ruler. Keep it the same all the way through. And you'll notice as you're doing this that some of the decorative elements, like the leaves in this, extend beyond that line. And that just makes it so that when you're matching these up, your pattern continues across the block and across the pieces and looks like one continuous stitch out instead of multiple pieces. At home, I just throw all this stuff on the floor and clean it up later. <laughs> it's probably not the right answer at work. Um, the border blocks um, trim out similarly, but I did the um, the placement, the cutting line again in black, but I can hardly see that on the black fabric. So these ones I actually flipped over and trimmed from the back because I could see where that line was. So this is a corner block. I actually don't have all my corner blocks done because I ran out of thread last night in three colors. Which is very sad. I don't like running out of thread. And I would have had enough thread had I only made one of these. But I made two. So now we have a nice little block like that. I'll trim the piece that lives next to the, to the deer face. That'll make the most sense. These two pieces match up, which I know because I sewed some together last night. Luckily, on this one, there's not a whole lot of pieces. It's actually only six pieces to build the inner part of this deer and the inner part of this quilt. So our layout, I would lay this all out before you start sewing it together. So you make sure that you have everybody oriented properly and feet on the right way and start seeing how this, how this will fit together. So it'll be just like assembling quilt blocks and any other quilting that you may have done. Or if you haven't done quilting, we're just assembling quilt blocks. They just happen to be stabilized. There's very low likelihood that these will stretch, but you do need to make sure they're aligned properly so that when you sew your deer body together, um, he matches up top and bottom. So to line up these kinds of points in this type of design, uh, you have a few different options. So in your design, you can start to see where pieces are going to overlap and where they join. So the leaves here, this leaf extends and it's going to finish out over on this side of the seam. These leaves through here, they're going to attach and join up. They're not going to be as critical and noticeable as the body of the deer being off by a thread or two or a millimeter, 
So you do want to get these things placed accurately. Um, this is a lot of bulk to pin through, so it's doable if you want to pin it. Um, but we have some other stuff called Acorn Precision Piecing Glue. So this is a heat activated glue. So this will help hold all these things in place because these are really stiff and a little slippery because they're so firm. So if there was a point that I needed to match up really pretty accurately, I like to mark a pin where that is and mark it and then mark it on the other side. So those two should line up. You can pin through those two points that you need super accurate um, placement on and you know that those are right. And then the glue, you can sew through this glue, which is great. You just need a drop on those points that you've ever so carefully lined up. You can hold that in place. Use a pin. Hopefully not iron yourself to anything. And there's instructions when you get the glue as to what to do with it. That's pretty straightforward and easy to use. You could also glue on the corners and all the way along the seam. If you're gentle with this, it should stay put. But they are glued enough that they'll go to your sewing machine and stay together. They're not super firm, but magic, holding it up. They are glued, they will stay together, which is just one less thing for you to worry about. Um, your other option that works really pretty nicely is clips. So you could clip those together along the way if you don't want to pin through all this bulk and these thicker. Um, you, you could pin through this, but I think you're going to get more distortion than you want when you start pinning through that thickness, is my thought there. So anyway, let's go to the sewing machine and sew a seam together. Um, this is a Bernina 570 Quilters Edition. Um, it has dual feed and a nine millimeter stitch width. So the foot I have on is the 97D, which is my favorite foot for quarter inch piecing on these um, wider seam allowance machines. And the foot does come with a seam guide that will stitch uh, so attach onto your plate if you want to use it. I'm not gonna use it. I don't feel like using it today. So seam guide for this 97D foot, screws on next to the foot. And then when you're checking to see if it's in the right place, you should be able to raise and lower the foot smoothly and easily past that seam guide. And I'm just doing that with the knee lift. And for this little bit of sewing on this block, I've actually chosen to use yellow thread, which might, may seem like a little bit of an odd choice. Um, but when I held the yellow thread up against this fabric, it was pretty much invisible. There's enough yellow tones in the fabric. It's kind of a creamy color that you couldn't see the, um, couldn't see the yellow in the seam line. And then, as you guys noted at the beginning, my outside seam line there is black. So we actually just need to sew kind of right on top of that so that it lands in the seam line or just inside the seam line and ends up um, to the back of the project when you press your seams open. So you don't really want to see black thread running through that project. And if I did this again, I would actually do this in cream thread and just deal with the fact that it's really hard to see to trim. But I didn't think of that at the time. I'm just gonna back up there. It's mostly so it gets going at the beginning of this lumpier stuff. And the seam guide on here is helping keep this fabric nice and straight and keep me right on top of that seam line that I need to be on top of. So the side blocks, they match up here as well. And I want to make sure that they're not offset a little bit when they come together. Uh, and I'm actually going to switch to black thread for this one. Because the first one of these I did with yellow thread last night. I can see the yellow thread in the seam line. Uh, the spot where we're joining the two colors together, I'm going to go with the lighter thread. 
that will hide better in the seam allowance usually. Once again, let's start inward. Um, you also have the option to move the needle over just a smidge on this. In that quarter inch foot, there is a slight option to move, move the fabric. In here, there's a slight offset top to bottom there. Um, most people wouldn't notice it. I know it's there because I'm making it. <laughs> My father-in-law who knows nothing about embroidery will have no idea. He will just think it's amazing. But that'll be along the bottom or the top of the quilt here. And then you might want to press these seams and there's a special way to press when you're dealing with um, embroidery so that you don't crush your embroidery. Um, OSD makes a press cloth. Um, the press cloth is designed to press your embroidery into to let it keep its structure. So thicker stitching like satin stitching can get crushed if you iron it too hard. And if you iron it into something really firm, you run the risk of doing that. So the OSD press cloth, we also need a clapper. So if we want this to lay super duper flat when we're done, we are gonna get a clapper. So good side of your embroidery down into your press cloth. And we're gonna want those hammered flat. So this lays flat when you get started. And we could steam this down into the press cloth. And then clap her on top and let it cool off that way. So when the heat goes into the clapper, you get nice crisp, crisp seams. So that is nice and flat. So flat. So flat. But your embroidery is not flat on the other side. And it's not crushed, which is the way you want it. So after we're assembled out to a bigger, bigger panel here, you're going to sew these together all the way across the rows and the borders all the way across. And then once you have your rows together, you can sew rows together. They're going to go together the same way. I would do the same things to align your seams so that your trees match up top to bottom and your legs are attached to your deer. You don't, you don't want a deer who's like had a time shift and teleported wrong. <laughs> Didn't all come through clearly. Um, once this is all done and you're ready to assemble it for your final wall hanging, uh, you can add batting in behind and a backing fabric so that nobody has to look at the back of your embroidery. And then really, really simple. You don't need to do much. There's so much stitching on here. It doesn't need to be properly quilted. Um, but stitching in the ditch, just a straight line down these seam lines will keep your batting and your backing um, in place behind your wall hanging. Um, and there's fusible battings. So you could fuse batting onto the back and then uh, fuse your backing in place and still just do a uh, stitch in the ditch kind of finish on it. It doesn't need anything fancy and a little bit of binding and maybe, maybe a pocket along the back to hang a rod through so that you can hang it up or whoever you give it to can hang it up. But it's really pretty simple embroidery once you get your head wrapped around it. So when mine's all done, it'll come hang in the store for a little bit because I'm really bad at actually hanging things on my walls at home. <laughs> I joke that I don't decorate. Um, I have nothing on my walls. I have good intentions, but nothing ever gets there. So uh, you'll be able to come see this. I'll show the finished piece once I have it on some batting and backing and some binding. But we don't need to watch all of that, I don't think. Maybe we do. You guys can say it in the comments if you want to watch that another day. So thank you for joining me. Um, be safe, be kind, be calm, and we'll see you.